Bonjour à, à toutes et à tous. Donc, il me revient de faire euh, l'introduction de la présentation de David Cooper. Je vais faire mon introduction en français. David fera sa présentation en anglais, puisqu'effectivement, il, euh, il nous vient du Canada, de, de l'Alberta plus précisément. Alors, je dois dire qu'il il, il est anglais à la base. Hein, donc, il me disait tout à l'heure qu'il préférait qu'on dise qu'il vienne du Canada. Depuis le Brexit, en fait, c'est une meilleure carte d'identité que, 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 que l'Angleterre, semble-t-il. Alors, faire l'introduction de, de David après la présentation d'Eve, c'est assez intéressant parce qu'on est à la fois... Dans, dans la continuité et puis dans un certain nombre de différences. Alors vous allez voir, ces présentations sont, vont, vont évoquer un peu les, les thèmes que Kev a, a évoqués sur, en, en nous emmenant sur d'autres terrains. Et en même temps, ce qui est intéressant, c'est que est un, David a fait le chemin inverse, en quelque sorte, de Eve. Eve est partie, est une, est une gestionnaire repentie. Et David, lui, était un, 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 a fait ses études en sciences sociales et s'est intéressé ensuite à la comptabilité. En fait. Donc c'est assez amusant de voir ce, ce double cheminement qui, qui s'inverse pour arriver finalement à des choses qui ne sont, qui ne sont pas, très, très, pas très, très éloignées. Donc, David, lui, est, est professeur émérite de, de comptabilité à l'Université à d'Alberta. Et puis, il est également professeur à l'Université d'Édimbourg, ce qui lui amène à passer quelques temps en, en Europe et, et venir nous voir. Alors, ces thèmes d'intérêt, ces thèmes de recherche sont principalement orientés vers ce que l'on appelle les, les recherches critiques en management, hein, qui visent à déconstruire les systèmes de management pour nous aider à comprendre comment fonctionnent les organisations et plus largement comment fonctionne la société. Donc il va s'intéresser à la comptabilité de gestion, au contrôle, à la régulation de, de, de ses activités et des corps qui les, euh, qui les exercent. Euh, ses recherches elles sont interdisciplinaires, donc il est amené à travailler à, à la, sur différents aspects de la gestion et puis avec différentes euh, branches des sciences, des, des sciences euh, sociales. Donc il va s'intéresser aussi bien à la sociologie, à, aux sciences politiques euh, qu'à la, qu la comptabilité, à la gestion. Euh, L'idée c'est de comprendre la régulation, le phénomène organisationnel, la, la rationalité managériale et puis les, les outils de la performance et de, de mesure de la performance et du management, un peu comme l'a décrit Eve, pour mieux comprendre euh, la société. Alors moi j'aime beaucoup ce positionnement euh, parce qu'en fait il renvoie à une vieille citation de, de Proudhon qui nous avait expliqué que le véritable économiste c'était le comptable auquel une coterie d'intellectuels avait volé le nom. Donc mes collègues économistes, Patrice, tu apprécieras. Euh, et en fait un, il y a un petit peu de ça quand même, hein, il y a un petit peu de ça dans, 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 dans le positionnement. Le, le comptable, en fait, il nous aide à comprendre la société en partant d'un point de vue assez micro et en en tirant sur les différentes branches, on arrive à comprendre ce qui se passe dans les organisations et plus généralement dans la société. C'est là-dessus que, que David a, a beaucoup travaillé avec essentiellement deux, deux grandes orientations. Une, une orientation sur la, la compréhension des phénomènes de globalisation dans, dans la société en, en mobilisant des théories, euh, théories néo-institutionnelles. Et puis, euh, c'est euh, donc en travaillant à la fois sur des entreprises, des, des, des secteurs publics et puis le secteur non gouvernemental. Et puis il a travaillé sur la régulation comptable, euh, sur les, les idées, les idéologies en fait, qui sont derrière la, les, les phénomènes d'autorégulation, de, derrière, les, derrière la, la régulation par les corps, les corps professionnels. En, en comptabilité, on a des professions organisées, donc c'est intéressant de comprendre ces professions organisées, comment elles travaillent, comment, quel est leur rapport aux autres acteurs dans, dans l'organisation. Alors il a, écrit, il a écrit au moins 9 livres, euh, un peu plus de 80 articles ou, ou chapitres dans des revues, dans des revues majeures et il est très impliqué dans deux revues qui nous sont chères, qui sont Accounting, Organization and Society, et puis CPA, Critical Perspective and Accounting, dont il a été l'un des fondateurs. Alors il a une passion, il a une passion à côté de la comptabilité, c'est d'aider les jeunes chercheurs en, fait, en, en comptabilité. Il a été très très actif en fait, de par le monde à aider des jeunes, des jeunes doctorants, et il en a aidé un certain nombre en fait, issus de l'Université Paris-Dauphine, donc ça nous avait amené à le récompenser, à le remercier il y a quelques années, en, le, en lui proposant un titre de docteur honoris causa de, de cette université université pour tout ce qu'il avait fait pour, pour nous et puis eh bien, il est arrivé il y a deux jours et il a remis ça en fait, il a retravaillé avec nos doctorants pour, pour les aider à améliorer leur, leur recherche. Voilà, je m'arrêterai là, je vous laisse la parole, merci beaucoup David pour uh, your, uh, your coming in France for this presentation. Merci uh, Professeur Bellan et Paris Dauphine. Uh, C'est un grand plaisir d'être avec, uh, avec vous aujourd'hui. And now into English. Um, so uh, I am truly grateful and uh, honored to be here. And uh, I thought I would start by... Um, do I have a clicker?
So, uh, yes, I'm truly grateful to be here and uh, to be associated with this distinguished university. And um, I would have loved to have been here earlier uh, to d have discussed last week the discussion of why we still need academics. I think uh, this is actually a disturbing question that we have to ask this, but uh, I think it is also a necessary one. Uh, and I was... Uh, I'm honoured to be uh, privileged, uh, honoured to be uh, participating in discussions today about crossing boundaries, uh, which I like to believe at least uh, has been my um, base of my work uh, since I started doing graduate studies in <sighs> 1970. Um, so uh, today I want to um, talk about boring. And I want to talk about why accounting, or how accounting is boring, uh, but also to say that boring is also powerful. And sometimes we can forget uh, that uh, accounting uh, can be powerful. And I want to talk about uh, the power of accounting, accounting ideas and institutions um, in, uh, in this afternoon's uh, talk. Um, but in many ways, I'm in the last uh, while, uh, I've been uh, particularly focusing on the symbolic impact of accounting. And uh, it was uh, wonderful to see Ev uh, say many of the things I wanted to say this afternoon in relation to the symbolic uh, impact of accounting. I guess it could, you could say great minds think alike. That, that may be uh, a little bit too arrogant on my behalf. So... Um, and I want to finish with um, some reflections as uh, I enter into my retirement years about what is to be done. And uh, so, I, so that's kind of my agenda for today. And um, I will, uh, I think, skip over some of the uh, parts two and three and uh, or skip over certainly, uh, I would say, fairly conventional understanding in part two and focus on three and four. And then maybe say a few words about five. So, yes, accounting is boring. Uh, the room uh, emptied uh, as uh, my turn came to uh, speak. Uh, accounting, of course, is depicted as technocratic, record-keeping, uh, only the dull of mind and dull of uh, personality uh, would be attracted to such a thing. Uh, it's associated with record keeping and with preparation of taxes. Uh, I remember when I was doing my PhD, somebody, a friend of mine, well, a former friend of mine, uh, said to me, so how many different ways can you do debits and credits? And um, I think this is, um, this is the kind of pop popular image, uh, with audits being seen as checking and controlling, uh, generally as unimaginative and dull. Um, and perhaps it attracts dull, tedious, and quantitative types. Certainly many of my students uh, are attracted to accounting other than family pressures to earn a good living. Uh, but the, uh, I'm good at math, therefore I must be, I can go into accounting. Uh, and when I try to say there is a lot of uncertainty to my students or lots of ambiguity, of course, they are very upset. They really do find this very disturbing. Um, and often uh, it uh, makes them wonder whether they really ought to be in the field. So, you know, accounting is boring. We have a number of images. We have the ledger, the dusty ledger. Um, we have, um, and I'm not sure you can read this here, some people think accountants are just, bo are just boring number crunchers. But statistics show that 43% of 456 people covering 56% of the total demographic was 67% sure that we're really a lot of fun. Okay, so I think um, this is a kind of uh, the image that we might uh, have, but... As the Enron story tells us, uh, the smartest guys in the room. Uh, boring, for me, is a mask. And uh, I want to talk about some of, strip away some of those masks. Um, maybe not go as far as Ben Affleck and be the assassin 
who was the accountant, hidden in plain sight. Um, but uh, so I want to uh, talk about the kind of the power of this um, uh, invisibility and this ridicule. Maybe boring is actually a deliberate strategy, a strategy by which it's easy to ignore, it operates behind our backs, it disarms op op uh, opponents, and it helps, and this is going to be part of my thesis, it helps to uh, treat uh, what we might, in other uh, instances, regard as rather strange or absurd or uh, partisan. We, try, we tend to treat it as normal and common sense. Um, also, of course, as I'm just observing in terms of the uh, people leaving the room, it's fearful. People are scared of, um, of the accounting. And so I've been privileged to be associated with a group of scholars uh, who've been loosely labeled themselves as interdisciplinary, cross-border uh, researchers to emphasize and think a little bit more about uh, the role of accounting as a language, as a language of business how it shapes our understanding of the world, the framing of decisions, the identification of value, and perhaps also the possibilities uh, for intervention or for supporting the taken for granted. So the, story, the, the conventional story that is told by accounting professors all over the world, I think, particularly those who have been are rooted in economics and a decisional uh, uh, framework, uh, talk about what we might call the kind of more straightforward and more and but no less powerful uh, roles of accounting in allocating resources, distributing resources around the world, and they have talked a little bit about financialization, uh, which is. A, a modern version, um, not a conventional uh, understanding, it, not the, the sort of language that many financial economists and financial accountants talk, but it, I think, is uh, a, a, a current manifestation of those, these effects. So the conventional story is uh, one about capital allocation in the economy. This is what I was taught as an undergraduate. Um, they have an important role in capital markets and stock valuation. Uh, the importance and the daily monitoring, well, I was going to say daily monitoring, this of course is uh, absurd, the microsecond monitoring of earnings per share, of uh, profitability, of stock, uh, of debt and so on. And accounting regulators, and I'll say a little bit more about them in a moment, uh, help to define and redefine what counts as an asset, what counts as liabilities, what counts in the calculations of earnings and debt and profitability. Uh, these issues are, mainly to, uh, are often talked about in relation to external reporting, but they also apply for internal reporting, uh, in terms of assessing the success or not of uh, individual units in large organizations. Becomes also a crucial issue, as I'll mention in a little bit, uh, when we think about tax shifting uh, between jurisdictions uh, and the crucial role that is played in the definition of uh, profitability and where it can show up, if I can put it that way, uh, in a multinational organization. That's a conventional story, and Ev, or, or, although she didn't refer to uh, Marilyn Waring's book, uh, Marilyn Waring uh, di did a, a lovely analysis, a feminist analysis, mainly about GMP and uh, the UN uh, development of uh, national income accounting in the 1940s, um, which helps to define debt and deficit and, of course, impacts fiscal and taxation policy. Uh, we can't afford 
spending, we can if we need to raise more tax, whatever that might be. Um, uh, but of course, what counts is uh, uh, depends on what we valorize, what we value in terms of uh, work and activities. Um, and so housework doesn't account, but if you buy a washing machine or you have a vacuum cleaner, that does count. Um, so if you do gardening in your garden, it doesn't count. If you are growing carrots for commercial use, it does count, uh, and so on and so forth. And um, uh, generally, uh, Marilyn Waring's uh, argument was particularly about the way in which women's work was undervalued. Uh, prostitution counts as uh, uh, contributes to GMP, but of course, making love is not valuable, okay? Uh, as my wife will tell me. Okay, uh, so, um, accounting and audit is presented as objective. We're dealing with hard data, with hard facts. Uh, others have talked about the appeal of quantification uh, and how this, uh, and accountants, I think, um, present themselves and articulate a social value in terms of independence and objectivity. We just deal with the facts. Um, and uh, there was a very uh, interesting um, interchange in uh, the UK Parliament many years ago in relation to um, uh, Margaret Thatcher was commenting on some work I had been doing uh, where she said, well, he, you know, I did, sh she argued that she deals with the facts and uh, the professor of accounting is dealing with uh, arbitrary numbers. Um, but whose facts and uh, whose evidence is to count, account, and as I was taught uh, even as an undergraduate, we need to be very, pay very careful attention to what assumptions are built into our fact making. So I think that's a fairly conventional story, a fairly well articulated, well understood uh, theory approach. Uh, I, I want to now to give you some uh, information about accounting institutions. And in many ways, I'm sure but some of this is already known to you from just the, um, the popular press and journalism and so on. But um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the multinational accounting firms currently the big four, uh, and uh, going to talk a little bit about uh, government auditors. And I will also, towards the end of my presentation, talk a little bit about uh, the uh, role of uh, accounting in the developing world, uh, the third world, if you will, the role of World Bank, international lending agencies, and international the role of accounting in international development uh, more generally. So the big four, many of these uh, logos I'm sure you're uh, familiar with. Um, this is a slide shows you the size of the, uh, or various ver versions of the size of the, uh, the four. This is, you know, the 30, 40 billion dollars US uh, in 2017. 700 odd offices around the world, most of them operating in upwards of 100 different countries. Uh, so widely dispersed and spread, um, employing many talented individuals. Uh, this tells you a little bit about their um, uh, self-reported um, information about what they do. They're not mainly auditors anymore. Some of the largest tax and le legal departments are in accounting firms. And consulting, as you can see, has, is a very large proportion. Uh, in the case of Deloitte, more than 50% of their activities, um, and so on. And in 2014, the big four accounting firms uh, together held 40% of the global market for consulting 
management consulting. These are organizations that provide advice, not just to corporations, not just to governments, advice about social policy, economic policy, tax policy, education policy, health policy. These are often, the advisors often have an accounting background, um, but also to, of course, universities. Your time will come uh, where you will be advised by very smart people. Okay, and here is some uh, indications you might uh, associate uh, management consulting with organizations like McKinsey's or with, uh, uh, I don't know, uh, well, a number of different uh, names. But you'll see that the, the uh, revenues are d uh, dominated by the big four accounting firms. It's true that a lot of the consulting work they do is what in consulting circles is referred to as grunt work. That is, it's uh, helping firms implement ERP systems or helping universities develop admissions policies and systems and so on. So there's a lot of the fairly uh, low-key hand-holding, uh, um, they would not call it hand-holding uh, work, but it does include providing advice about policies, a variety of different policies. I thought I would just uh, look at a number of uh, French companies that I'm familiar with, all smaller than any of the accounting firms. Um, but the point I wanted to make was all of these firms have to provide public information that is audited and that at least nominally we can hold them accountable about, about their behaviour and what they're doing and what investments they're making and how their employees and how much they pay their uh, senior uh, staff and so on and so forth. The information I, provi I provided on the previous slides is all the information that the accounting firms, out of their generosity, provide to us without any check, without it being audited. You might have thought that audit firms would audit or have auditors to provide the pu their information. No, it's their public relations department. They each produce their information in their own way, in their, on their own terms. This is uh, uh, without uh, an ability for us to uh, examine the basis of this information. So that information is um, somewhat more unreliable, but I think it provides a bit of a picture. But the point is, auditors don't need to be audited. Okay? Um, and in one sense, it's very difficult to hold them accountable. The way they would say they are held accountable, of course, is by their own logic. We have demand for our services. Therefore, we must be doing a good job. It's, it's a kind of neat argument. And we have professional bodies uh, who develop accounting rules. We have, well, we have, of course, um, professional bodies, uh, uh, institutes of accountants, um, who are constantly struggling between commercial and what I would, we might call traditional or feudal norms. Uh, they are act, we are told, in the public interest. Uh, noblesse oblige. They, um, they, uh, and the, this uh, struggle between commercial and, uh, and uh, feudal norms, I think, is one that is ongoing. Uh, I think it's interesting because, of course, the other aspect of this is noblesse oblige may be a very good commercial practice. If I can tell you I'm acting in the public interest and I have the welfare of my client at heart and I'm not driven by profit, I do things for the public interest, this is actually quite a good commercial strategy for getting business. Um, Arthur Anderson's failed eventually in that, on that score, even though in the end the courts t turned around and said they'd actually done nothing wrong. Um, but by that time they had uh, disappeared as a, uh, one of the accountants. At that time, the big five. 
the International Accounting Standards Board, which the EU, for example, um, relies on uh, for developing accounting rules for corporations in uh, European countries, and the FASB in the US, um, which remains the only uh, major country that doesn't, comp doesn't feel the necessity to, uh, to uh, comply with IASB rules. I mean, there is some convergence. So they work hard to try and converge, but they are still separate entities. These organizations are dominated by personnel from the big firms and by an ideology, I would say, of capital markets, seeing that the only legitimate users are large, sophisticated investors. Not, as it was even in the 1950s, the simple investor, my grandmother or my aunt or even me, not the amateur investor, but the sophisticated investor. And the information they provide is targeted and is seen to be relevant to the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, it, the uh, expert investor. S to such an extent, and I won't have time to go on to this, that when they are lobbied about, um, for example, environmental accounting or other social issues and suggest that they may want to try and standardize social disclosures or environmental disclosures and so on. They are told, they say that this is outside their remit because those are social and political issues. But providing in information to investors is neutral. It's not nothing to do with, um, um, so they, could, they, uh, they appeal to their mandate and uh, and argue that if an NGO argues for or makes suggestions for certain types of disclosure, that this is outside their, uh, is it illegitimate in fact, outside their concern. So the, f the fourth L uh, part of my uh, thesis I, is inspired, I guess, by Pierre Bourdieu uh, and is concerned with the uh, issue of uh, symbolic violence, violence wielded with tacit complicity between its victims and its agents. Uh, we are all part of that, um, the power of uh, language. Uh, we are captured by it. We, we are complicit in that uh, language. Uh, while we remain unconscious of submitting to or wielding it. This is the the kicker, the, uh, the kicker in the tail. Um, so, referring to my notes, I've jumped ahead of several pages. Um, so, accounting as the language of business affects how people see, what they see, and so on and so forth. Uh, it, it helps to identify what are the important aspects of the world, what are not uh, aspects that we're going to talk about. Um, and, of course, defines the bottom line uh, in terms of what is the legitimate and dominant purpose of business and governments to make profits. We even these days talk about the bottom line of governments, uh, whether it's the deficit or the debt, okay? Which, of course, then occludes other ideas and concerns about uh, organizations, about the work experience, environment, product, product safety, uh, qu quality of the services provided, and so on. And this is something that is um, important, I think, and it, not new, it's important. When I taught introductory accounting, I asked students, the first year student undergraduates, so provide me with an account. I mean, I was being uh, a bit uh, devious with the use of my language, but provide an account of the university, and students would tell us about all the exciting things that were happening, or all the scary things, or about their student experience. And then I would give the, put on the table the accounts. Your, the, all your experiences, all your accounts are not here. 
There may be a, a, a number of students, the number of students, but this, the account of the university is in euros or dollars or whatever it might be. And the, this is what counts. If you provide fees and tuition, then you count a bit. If you don't provide tuition, then you're invisible and your needs and concerns are ignored. And we see this as something that has become more and more uh, uh, the case in universities and hospitals and charities and so on. Ever talked about uh, financialization, was asked a question about when did it happen and how has it happened and uh, it's been happening for, you know, for 20, 30 years. I can remember talking with plane makers and uh, oil companies in the 1970s who said, most of our profit is made through our financial transactions. It's not selling your car, you a car. It's not selling a Boeing 757 that is important. To, those, to GM or to Toyota or to uh, Boeing, uh, it is the financial arrangements surrounding those products, the leasing of the, of the aircraft, encouraging you to lease your vehicles. This is where the money is to be made, okay? Um, and so we have the rise of accounting talk uh, a neoliberal discourse of neutrality and efficiency of markets, uh, which a, an entrepreneurial profession, uh, if I wish to um, annoy my legal colleagues, I will, tell, I will say the accountants have been much more entrepreneurial than you in seeking new markets, in being willing to, do, to sell services which they know very little about, and they learn on the job much less concern about formalized education, but much more uh, willingness just to be entrepreneurial, okay? And if not surprisingly, perhaps, the, uh, one of the other things that has happened is that the, uh, uh, the advisors, the business and, uh, advisors, have important social and cultural capital in the modern world. So, um, what I want to emphasize is that economic discourse, the language of economics, the language of markets, the language of finance, is made operational through accounting and auditing. So, in one sense, it is boring. It is technical. It is detail-focused. But how you calculate a cost, how you define a benefit, how you measure uh, these things makes an enormous difference. And you can have all the debates about uh, GMP or investments and savings and, uh, and so on, um, but without an awareness of how these costs and what is included and what is excluded, you don't realize what debate you're buying into, you're contributing to. And I want to just say a few words particularly. So I think and I think one of the interesting things with the financialization is the decline in academic voices. Maybe not true in France, thank goodness, but, but in many countries, if you look to the news and you ask for economic commentators, these are no longer academics. These are no longer university professors. These are economists employed by banks or consulting firms, yeah? And um, what I want to talk a little bit about is uh, the kind of way in which words that become really popular, I would say, these days, you know, the word, in my world, the world, uh, the word, you know, you have to be transparent, you have to be accountable. But what does the, these terms mean? And what I would uh, argue is that these terms are understood in accounting terms. Maybe not the way uh, I would think about this in my family life, but I find that talking with my wife or my children, 
expecting my children to be accountable. I don't yet ask them for a balance sheet or an income statement. But I know colleagues who do. Um, but, and we find these uh, discourses about accountability and transparency pervading more and more areas of life. So, accountability. What does accountability mean in this concept? context? Well, most of the time this is, upward, this is upward accountability. You explaining to your boss how you've done. You producing a report for senior administrators in this university about your research output, your impact, or whatever. Okay? I don't think we see very much downward uh, uh, accountability. You know, what of how have our uh, senior people uh, provided um, uh, the facilities, the resources, the atmosphere, the opportunity to do our work? It's a kind of one way, one notion of accountability. Um, we certainly rarely talk about what has sometimes been referred to as social accountability, moral accountability to our, account to our colleagues. Um, and it's uh, linked, I think, to kind of an individualized project of responsibility and a moral uh, justification for behavior. Another image, efficiency. So why is the person who's got the ball pushing ahead being more efficient than the inefficient personnel elsewhere. Efficiency is defined and measured in terms of input-output ra ratios, but I've already talked, and I've talked uh, even more uh, f fully about you know, what is measured, what is recognized, what is not measured, what is ignored. So I could be more efficient by inf enforcing greater speed up in a, on a production line making professors work longer hours. This is more efficient. You're being more efficient. Okay? And it's, of course, focused on market uh, transactions, so only those costs that are understood within the marketplace in terms of financial transactions uh, and are, are counted, and things like increased effort, greater stress, more pollution... Other forms of exploitation are ignored and excluded from the analysis. This is just the discourse because who wants to be inefficient? Nobody wants to be inefficient. Nobody wants to be unaccountable. Well, actually, I do want to be unaccountable, um, uh, but that's, uh, I won't get into domestic politics. Um, uh, but mo most of the time, we wish to be accountable. We do recognize the kind of moral imperative to be accountable to the people around us, to the society more generally. Um, but it's defined in certain ways. The ways that the boring accountant is very uh, influential on. Transparency. I don't know about in uh, France these days, but if you're not transparent in Canada, you're nobody, right? We all have to be transparent. Fortunately, that, doesn't mean, that does not yet mean we have to wear uh, transparent clothing, but uh, we know that uh, with uh, modern technologies, our moods can be identified and we can become, we're becoming more and more transparent uh, in order to sell us the services and products that uh, we're thought to be needing. Okay? So in terms of transparency, I think this is a really interesting one. I had an interesting discussion with some of the doctoral students yesterday about uh, some aspects of transparency, and the, um, uh, they thought that when I was dubious about the value of disclosure, thinking about the costs of disclosure as in terms of information overload, 
but also in terms of the benefits of ambiguity, the benefits of opacity. You really do not want to see me naked, I assure you. Okay? Uh, the, the, uh, so, uh, but we will see that in more and more dimensions, and uh, here I've just uh, refers to the, the IMF have a recent fiscal transparency code, trying to make countries more transparent. Uh, this is seen as ways to include, increase confidence, but it encourages an investment in more and more disclosures, more and more uh, information which people have a great deal of difficulty making sense of um, and understanding. This is not a one-way process, and in terms of you know, what is to be done, I think the point in, the, um, in bold here is uh, important. Uh, yes, I've been trying to emphasize uh, uh, how language affects our understanding of the world, how debates, for example, in the EU about debt and deficit and who's contributing, whether I'm contributing enough, you know, blah, blah, blah. This is uh, constant stuff, not just in the EU, but even within countries like Canada. You know, Alberta, we are giving those bums in Quebec so much money. You know, this is all about understandings of uh, calculations and uh, understanding about uh, how people interrelate, relate, how governments interrelate. But I think if society, whoever society is, uh, asks that we um, shift the language, then maybe, as I said, the accounting profession has been very entrepreneurial. They're willing to meet new demands for new services without very much uh, doubt, self-doubt, without very much knowledge. They will build their knowledge and their expertise from experience. Okay. So, I have a f just a few moments more, perhaps. Uh, I'm not going to repeat that. Uh, some of you may have read or know of uh, the work of Michael Power at LSE, who's talked and written about uh, the audit society, how audit and an audit mentality, uh, a box-ticking mentality, a mentality or, that auditors have, which is about fantasies of control, fantasies of perfection. This is how a good organization should run. If it's not running that way, you are deficient. The auditors will tell you that you should need to improve your processes to be more like this fantasy of a perfection. Um, this is something that um, this mental approach is being applied in many other, whether it's medical audits or educational audits and school audits, university audits and so on. This is something that is um, pervasive. Um, think. And the irony, of course, is the more there are scandals, the more we ask for more accounting and more auditing. Okay? Even when it's a, a scandal that has been created by accountants or auditors, as in the case with Enron or WorldCom or Parmalat, uh, oil for food uh, with the Iraq sanctions and so on. Uh, the demand is, well, the solution is, have, let's have more accounting. Let's have more auditing. Let's have more disclosure. Let's have more transparency. Which then makes these organizations, the big institutions I talked about, even more profitable, even more pervasive, um, and so on. Okay, what is to be done? I'll just say a few words about what is to be done. Um, I'm not, I'm not a, a Lenin, so I don't have a very uh, pervasive understanding of what is to be done, and I'm perhaps a little bit more micro than... Uh, there are no question about being Lenin. <laughs> <laughs> this is true. 
So I've been trying to uh, tell a story uh, to my students and to my colleagues about trying to act a little bit more as I think Ev has for, men, for much of her career and other, other colleagues as public intellectuals. To highlight the, the, the role of accounting um, and to be able to dig deeper into the specifics of uh, issues and challenge powerful institutions and so on. Uh, and what I thought I would just end up rather than go through what lots of my colleagues have done uh, I'll just give you a little example, um, which is I'm working on, currently I was uh, proofreading a, a, a document for governments uh, this morning. Um, this is um, about environmental liabilities in oil and gas. So Alberta, which is where I live, has a lot of oil and gas. Not as much as Texas and not as much as Oklahoma these days, but it's more reserves apparently than Saudi Arabia. Okay, so this is a uh, big, uh, okay. Associated with the particular ways that oil is produced in Alberta, a number of you may have heard of tar sands. Uh, we call them oil sands in Alberta, we don't call them tar sands. Um, and we claim they are ethical, it's ethical oil because it's not a corrupt political regime like the Saudis or the Ven from Venezuela. So you have ethical, clean oil from Alberta. Anyway, enough with the irony. Um, one of the things that is occurring as a result of all the uh, economic activity is that it's creating these large tailing ponds like you may have read about in, uh, with the collapse of da tailings dams in Brazil, you know, killing hundreds of people uh, when the, uh, the walls uh, collapse. These tailing ponds cover literally hundreds and thousands of square miles. These are huge um, ponds of gunk. I can't think of the technique, but, you know, environmentally dubious act uh, stuff, okay? Um, the oil industry, of course, as well, is, uh, uh, must recognize it's on the downward spiral as country, more and more countries are trying to decarbon their economies and reduce their economies. Of course, Alberta still goes on investing more and more doubling its production, trebling its production, looking for more pipelines to get the oil to market quicker and cheaper and so on. And so we have lots of um, uh, potential stranded assets. So there are a number of different issues that we are working on. And this is like an example of what might be done. We could try and ensure that firms, the oil and gas firms themselves, produce estimates in their financial statements or in their public documents about their expected costs of environmental light cleanup. The accounting rules for what needs to be disclosed are sufficiently loose that they have to uh, predict or they are only required to pr uh, produce estimates of probable costs in the future. And if they feel that they can continue producing forever and the price will keep going, they, they're talking about 50, 100 years before they have to worry about these cleanups. And of course, then they are going to discount them because they are good economists and they want to discount these costs for 50 and 100 years back to the present, okay? So the figure they have on their balance sheet for their liabilities is zero. Of course, they do, they do uh, contribute to a fund that Regulator has a fund in Alberta. They contributed $1.6 billion to allow for cleanup, particularly for firms that go bust. Very socially responsible of them. There's a slight problem. 1.6 billion fund 
estimated liabilities by the independent regulator, well, independent, it's funded by industry, but even the, indus uh, the regulator for the industry says that the best estimate they have of the liabilities are 60 billion, and they, the, uh, uh, not extreme, but a more pessimistic case, is $260 billion liability. 1.6 has been put in the fund, okay? So now I'm trying to convince both the government of Alberta that this is going to land on your step door. Taxpayers are going to be paying for this. You need to be recording this in your financial statements in the province. $260 billion is far, more than five times their annual revenues of the government, to give you a sense of scale. This is large, okay? If the government of Alberta uh, aren't willing to do it, the other uh, approach is to talk to banking and finance regulators and say to them, there's a lot of stranded assets coming down the pipe. And the actually the... Um, the Global Stability uh, Fund, which was set up after the, GA, uh, after the 2008 fiscal uh, crisis, they've just commissioned a report that from Bloom, Michael Bloomberg, who points out that these types of liabilities, you thought mortgage securitization was a bad thing? You ain't seen nothing yet. Okay, so trying to get governments and regulators to take this seriously, to, inc to change the accounting rules about how we measure these environmental liabilities, this is something that we can, you know, it's, it's one thing we can do to try and make a difference. So that's, I need to finish. I should have finished a while back. Uh, so... Being boring is, does not mean not important. Recognize, be aware of symbolic violence and our own involvement in symbolic violence. Control accounting, don't let it control you. Let's try and make accounting institutions, both the firms, but also the professional bodies and the regulatory bodies, more you know, have more democratic control. So the FAS, the EU has done a little bit about this, but Ave has written about this, how, Ave, uh, uh, how the EU allowed the privatization of accounting regulation. Okay, certainly true also in the FA, uh, with the FASB in the US. So optimism, I was accused yesterday of being a bit too pessimistic. Optimism and history suggest that accounting techniques and systems can be used differently, can be created differently, can be used uh, progressively. So. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. Is there any question? Uh, I have two questions. Number one, you mentioned uh, Sun for Alberta, like 260 billion and so on. Are they discounted? I mean, we're talking about things that will happen 100 years from now. Are you talking about a thing discounted to today? No, this, this is an, uh, a, a, an estimate of the likely costs of cleanup. Okay. Which will happen in the 100 in years the from now. So they're not discounted. Then there's they're not. They're not discounted. Well, I would argue, for, by the way, just as a moral argument, that they should be compounded, not discounted. Compounded because I'm leaving the burden for my children, my grandchildren, and so on. I should bear the cost of them having to do it in the future. So I'm actually opposed to a notion of, com of discounting. Okay. Let's have compounding of these costs. Well, but yeah. one issue would be, if you discount it, what interest rate do you use? That would be because 10% uh, from now is zero today. So you have the issue of interest rates. That's my first question. Mm -hmm. And the second question is, you had this very interesting notion about accounting being language. That is true. 
could you imagine several languages? I mean, could you have an environmental? What do you think would be better for the future? To have an environmental accounting and a financial accounting, so two languages? Or well, would it be better to try to fit in, to adapt the financial language to include some environmental ones? Okay. So for, on your first point about interest rate, corporations have to disclose the rate they are using. They can use any rate they want, but they have to disclose it. So if you look at Total, they will, have, they will tell you what figure they're using. Okay? Uh, and it, var it will vary quite a lot between firms. Um, on, in t terms of your second p uh, question, which was... Would it be better to have a separate accounting for all the environmental issues, or would it be better to have, so you'd have two accounts for a single firm, or would it be better to have a single account where you try to fit in everything and price the cost of the environment? This is a very important question and one I don't have a, a good answer to. Um, Esperanto didn't last very long as a universal language. Uh, on the other hand, we don't want the Tower of Babel with everybody talking their own language and not being able to communicate. Um, there have been debates about multiple accounts, counter accounts, alternative accounts. And maybe this is all that we can hope for, uh, that we will have a small Tower of Babel, multiple accounts. There will be the official account and then there will be access for other accounts. There was a fantasy at one point, uh, a proposal that was made in the 60s or 70s, I, th I think from a professor from New York, which was that everybody should have access to the, the financial records of every company in the world. It was called events accounting, where we would just, you know, everything would be open. This would be open access par excellence. I don't know that it would be very helpful to have open access. Um, so these things have been discussed and debated. I don't, think, I don't think there's been a lot of discussion about it, and there's certainly no consensus about it. Any other question? Yeah? I have one. point about transparency. On the one hand, you complain there's too much transparency. Then you say, we you know, we need more numbers. Uh, so it seems to me that what you want to say is that, there's trans that although there's an ideology of transparency, there's no effective transparency because they're not revealing the, re the important numbers. But we're all in favor of transparency. We want to see how much, how much this environmental cost environmental impact of the star sands, as we call yes. them yeah. south of the Canadian border, uh, are going to be. I mean, to claim, oh, it's bad to have transparency, let them no. have whatever, whatever number they want. So that's, that's, that's uh, one point. The other thing is that I think you under, sometimes underestimate how much, how, or overestimate how much, how seriously people take accounting numbers. In the sense Thank that God. If I am a, if I am a, if I am a, um, let's suppose a value investor, somebody like Buffett or, or, or all the people that came from Colombia. Uh, all those guys, all this time they spend doing this, what are the accountants doing wrong? Because they assume there are some people that believe accounting numbers and they make a lot of money. You know, for instance, you talk about R&D expenses, you know, those guys, that's an old trick. But there's a lot of other tricks like yeah, that that sure. people use to, to undo that. So I think there are two things two sides to the story. One is that I think we actually need better numbers, more numbers. Um, and the other is that it may be a very well be that when the accounting profession produces a lot of bad numbers, some cases they're, they're, they are believed, and there was a tragedy of Enron, for instance, where people believed the numbers that uh, Arthur Anderson produced. But sometimes people just say, well, yeah. It's just the accountants doing their stuff. Oh, and I think there is a lot of public, uh, uh, popular skepticism about accountants. And there's a lot of... No one can make money out of accounting. A lot of implicit not, uh, understanding that, uh, certainly, for example, in unions, that they don't trust 
the accounting figures that firms provide them with. So there is a lot of popular skepticism, but I think there's also a degree of, I was going to say complicity, but I think a degree of passivity in the complexity sure. of the calculations. So your points are well taken, and nobody has ever accused me of being consistent in my arguments. Um, and, I don't, and I don't mean that entirely frivolously. What we need to understand much better than I think we do is under what conditions is particular forms of disclosure worthwhile, and under what conditions does it lead to obfuscation and confusion? And I think we are not... We, we haven't done enough work in that... that There's some interesting economics work on that. And I know there when is. When is public disclosure yeah, you yeah, know, yeah. optimal or not? Yes. And we can talk about optimal confusion. I can remember even as a teacher talking to e my econom uh, economist friends uh, when I was at Manchester University who would talk about, in terms of teaching, and students, close your ears, uh, yeah, what was the optimal amount of confusion we should give our students? that would incentivize them to study to themselves. Learn. Yeah, thank you. Okay, thank you very much again.